There we go. Hey. <laughs> hey. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. All right. <laughs> I've not used Instagram Live at this desk, so I think I'll raise the phone up a little. Yeah, it's always a, <laughs> even if I have a setup and I still have to like adjust it every time I get on. Um, How's that? Uh, well, I have like a, one of those like holders for your phone with like the fancy light and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, anyways, that's, that's neither here nor there. It's behind the scenes little uh, a sneak peek. Um, but welcome everyone in Niche Conversations. Um, I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm one of the editors here at the Network in Canadian History and Environment. And today I am joined once again by Josh McFadgen. Do you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm coming to you from uh, UPEI here on the uh, UPEI campus. The Applied Communication Leadership and Culture Program is where I'm an associate professor here in the ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq, which I uh, am privileged to be able to work in. And I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting with you about something that I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and I can, it's cool to see, I can see some uh, current and former students uh, popping on too. So um, hopefully they'll correct me if I say anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so yeah, we're talking about this piece that you wrote in July, 2013, I think, Swallowed by the Seashore. And the reason I was like, let's chat about this is that in the last year or so, I've noticed like an, an uptick in readers to this piece. And I just think it's interesting how a piece this old, and we'll get into this later, is getting some traction. Um, so to start off, this piece is about the St. Peter's Harbor Lighthouse. And can you tell us what's special about this lighthouse? Sure. Yeah, and I should say, too, that uh, when I wrote it, I was, I guess, temporarily, what's the word, um, precariously employed, <laughs> um, uh, recent post, recent doctoral student and, uh, and work in a postdoctoral fellowship at Niche. And I did this because I didn't, this wasn't part of my research you know, directly. I think I say yeah. that in the post. This was part of a photo competition, but one of the ones that Niche would run every summer. Uh, getting people to send in a cool mm -hmm. picture from their research. And I had no kind of research connections to this uh, particular lighthouse at this time. But I, I'll, I kind of thought it was it's just a beautiful location. And, and um, uh, others have found that as well, including a uh, big shout out to Barbara Russo, who I think joined, at least I can see who, who's joined. Yeah. And um, it, which is great. She, uh, she went on to write some way more interesting stuff about this than I did and probably generated a lot of the hits herself <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, in recent year or this year particularly. But um, so I started writing with the lighthouse because I thought it was kind of really visually appealing. But then I started, I was looking at this larger area for a project that I was doing and co-writing with Alan McCachron um, mm -hmm. on land use and coastal change, but also just kind of land use change in Prince Edward Island. And the St. Peter's area is just across from Greenwich, uh, which is part of the PEI National Park. Um, it's the latest addition to the PEI National Park. And I was, uh, for the Park 75th anniversary, um, Alan and I were co-writing um, a, a, an exhibit. And happily, uh, since then, I've kind of finally finished a book that's about, uh, about land change across the whole island and a whole bunch of different places. But this one episode does appear there. Um, the episode is that St. Peter's Harbor is part of uh, several places named uh, named St. Peter's in, in uh, PEI. Then we have St. Peter's Road, St. Peter's Bay, St. Peter's Harbor, um, and the sort of village of St. Peter's. So this was the, uh, at the mouth of St. Peter's Bay, um, uh, a historic community um, that was known uh, for, for centuries to the Mi'kmaq, but for a long time to the Acadians as well as Havre St. Pierre, um, St. Peter's Harbor. And, and uh, Barbara Russo goes into a whole bunch of interesting history about the naming of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the capital, it was essentially the most important uh, location, settlement for, um, for uh, Acadians at one point. And they were um, based out of this harbor. And I, it's very difficult to kind of know exactly where it is. And you look at the uh, French period, the maps drawn in the French period, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a few different uh, maps and they're really, you know, um, 
it's really imprecise. It's very difficult to tell kind of what is where. So if it's confusing today, it's even more confusing back then. But we were trying to figure out where this uh, lighthouse was and, uh, or where this harbor was. And it turns out the lighthouse um, today is several hundred meters away mm. from the water. And it's just beautiful lighthouse and standing up uh, through the middle of the sands. And so for the photo competition, I just included it, but then I added these uh, two, um, you can see at the top of the post, these two other images kind of nested mm. into, the, into the dunes. So that picture, I think was, um, oh boy, I can't remember the credits now, I have to look closely, but my mother took a few photos of the area, so it might be hers. But um, that lighthouse in the middle of the dunes is a, is a test, it's a, uh, a datum or a landmark that can show us how the land has mm -hmm. changed so dramatically. So part of this was also an interest in looking at the sort of many sides of coastal change. Um, we, we know, especially in Prince Edward Island, and especially after big events like the Fiona um, tropical storm hurricane, um, that the coastline erodes and it erodes rapidly in some places, slowly in other places, but the coastline also changes in other ways. And so when sand is removed, it has to go somewhere, usually often goes out to sea, but sometimes comes back in. And so depending on prevailing um, tides and prevailing uh, was a shoreline drift, I believe is one of the technical terms, you can end up getting uh, huge amounts of sand deposited. And that's what happened here. So there was uh, a French harbor. And then in the 19th century, it was a British, um, a Canadian, and then a Canadian harbor. Um, but in the earliest air photos that we have of PEI, the 1935 um, uh, photo, so you're looking top down, mm -hmm. uh, you can see that the lighthouse is right on the harbor. And the fish, this was the fishing harbor. Um, and on the pier. And if you go to that spot now, you can still see remnants of the pier very close to where the lighthouse is. And they are, they're way like hundreds of meters in from the, from the ocean, from the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and from where the, where fishing boats currently go. They currently go to Redhead Harbor, which is a significant distance to the east of this, mm -hmm. of this lighthouse. And so uh, a few, a few years later, that wharf was abandoned because of all the sand that was building up around there. And over the decades, we see that this is a place not of coastal erosion, but of coastal accretion. And this building up of sand actually then accumulates, grows uh, marim dune grass. Um, and the dunes that are, that are shown in the photo like around the lighthouse are just covered in grass. And then eventually that creates in the, in the kind of ecological succession, creates uh, conditions for uh, larger vegetation. You can eventually have a forest in there. It takes centuries. Um, but dunes, you know, beaches turn into dunes, turn into forests, turn into, uh, you know, different environments completely. So the whole point of this was to show how one lighthouse and some cool photos and air photos of it can show uh, a changing landscape over almost a century at that point mm -hmm. um, in ways that very recent, and you could even say, you know, um, uh, short-sighted uh, histories of coastal change we're showing otherwise. So that was my, my plug in the photo mm -hmm. competition for how we should listen to more environmental historians. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a really interesting post and I think the visuals are part of why it's so interesting. Um, it really does, you know, any post that has like really good visuals is always um, for a general public, you know, eye catching and it's easier to kind of wrap your head around some of these larger processes when you have those visuals. Um, which kind of gets into our next question, which I wanted to chat with why maybe if you have some ideas as to why, even though it was written nine and a half years ago, this post is still getting consistent readership. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like I said, big shout out to Barbara Russo, who, who, who kind of, um, I think moved, I think the story is, if I get it correctly here, she moved to the area from Ottawa and, and just uh, had, a, had a home nearby um, and found my blog post on Niche uh, when doing some searches to kind of find out history or information mm -hmm. about, the, about the area. Found my blog post and just kind of kept going where I left off and said, you know, how, what else can we find out about this place? And mm -hmm. uh, she published her first Niche article uh, in June or July this year. Yep. And it is called, if I get the name right here, uh, The Disappearing Harbor. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, navigating the environmental history of St. Peter's Harbor. 
so that was June. It was a great, uh, it's a great article. Um, I was chuffed that somebody you know, had found something that I wrote on the niche page, and then he, there, almost ten years later, uh, they they got to contribute their own piece and build onto it. <clears throat> There's been another uh, post since then because since then we had uh, we had of course Hurricane Fiona in mm-hmm. in September 24th into October, mm-hmm. um, and so she wrote a, she wrote another piece, a follow up piece, to show just how much Dune. Um, damage had been done and how much kind of sand had been relocated. There's another uh, really cool side story. If you want to read that one, it's called Such Quantities of Sand, which mm-hmm. is the post kind of uh, quoting the Lewis Carroll wal- walrus and the carpenter poem. Um, and in that, there's a there's another sort of fascinating uh, revelation that um, a, a sign had been posted by the Nature Conservancy. Okay, I'm like, I'm forgetting now who posts, who put this sign up, but that sign over the years, just like the lighthouse got covered in sand and then it was growing dune grass over it. Mm-hmm. And because of Fiona, it was then revealed. So it, there's been so many landmarks and so many parts of this environment that have been sort of covered up and revealed. So there's one case, uh, hurricane hits, uh, people move to the area, tourists and, um, and, and seasonal residents alike build up and they, they kind of want to learn about it. So when we mm-hmm. write public history, it has this long, um, it has this long, I guess, life that people can uh, keep finding it years later and in her case, build on it, um, which, which is great. But also there's like the lighthouse community, I think, the lighthouse nerds. Um, they, uh, they're a dedicated historical group and they probably were, were reading this over time. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you, Barbara said, Nature Conservancy of Canada sign. Um, that's cool, I saw that in the comments. So yeah, lighthouses are, I think, historical beacons as well as lights and they you know show us coastal and land use change over this much longer period so you know i've got in the new book which is still called time flies the the title that uh, Mm -hmm. that i used for the uh a poster that i had submitted to um ascH with with alan um shows kind of land use change over the whole island there's only a couple of other lighthouses in the book but each one of them there's a few coastal sites where the, the St. Peter's Harbor story is either replicated or reversed in other places, but you see people kind of geoengineering their coastlines uh, with rudimentary tools. Now, whether that's you know, Parks Canada at Robinson's Island or whether it's in, uh, Robinson's Island is part of PEI National Park um, that gets kind of heavily and dramatically changed um, through kind of human development. But then other places we see farm families, even um, settlers, fishers, farm families, trying to change the coast. And sometimes it goes the way they want. And sometimes it goes, uh, it goes awry. But uh, so anyway, I think that kind of those different communities are all mm-hmm. looking for um, historical information and finding our public history years, years down the road, which is really cool. Yeah. There's another phenomenon that I want to touch upon because I see the stats of the st- site behind the scenes. And one thing I've noticed is that Friends Over at Island content does really well. For instance, um, both of Barbara's pieces and your and Margot's piece about uh, potato farming and PEI are all on the running for the top five posts of this year. Um, wow. And they do exceptionally well on Facebook. And I think there's just something about PEI, PEI folks that like they see content about their communities and stuff and they really like go for it. I don't know if you have anything to comment on there. About. Oh, can, you, can you tell if it's actual readers from the island and from the region or is it is it just uh, cool? like I think Sean maybe know how to look for actual geographic. I don't know. I'm just assuming because when I see yeah. something take off on Facebook, Usually that's when it hits a general audience, they have a personal connection to it. That's what like really brings people in like to that sort of thing. So when all this PEI content, you know, like who knew that, you know, the history of potato farming on PEI was so like (laughs) popular, you know, but people got really into it. Um, And it's something that I don't notice with other regions. I don't notice like (laughs) that, like consistent um, popularity with posts. Um, and ironically, our, our readership, our, our population base is so small. Yeah. We're approaching 160,000 people on the island. Although one that, that uh, increases by 10 times in the summer, 1.6 million tourists mm-hmm. come. That, that is part of it, right? PEI yeah. has 
as this kind of brand for the rest of the country and beyond that uh, that many people find attractive and of interest. But yeah, we have a very small kind of local readership. I'm frankly super surprised that uh, that, these, <laughs> <laughs> that these posts are are so popular. But it's it's great to hear. Um, yeah. 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 Uh yeah, like Barbara's post got a couple thousand reads in one day on Facebook. So like, you know, like, that's really the with the such quantities of sand. So that's like, kind of like the PI fam phenomenon, plus the current event phenomenon. And anyways, it's all interesting, yeah. which I guess rolls into my last thing I wanted to talk about, which was, what does the continued popularity or just the consistent popularity of this post tell us more generally about public history writing? Yeah, I think that it's worth doing, um, that it's worth, I guess, it, it might seem like an interruption to respond to the niche photo competitions back in 2013. Um, but, you know, to his credit, Alan always encouraged uh, encouraged that kind of thing. I think he's got a, his vested interest, too, in seeing PEI uh, history explored. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, that was at the time I was trying to finish my book, which is not on PEI, uh, <laughs> um, agriculture and flax around the rest of the country, yeah. but there was very little in PEI. So I couldn't, uh, couldn't even attempt to make that about, about the island. But all I had to say, taking an aside from, from our kind of more academic writing, um, and then taking the time to do, to write good public history, I think is, um, uh, pays off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> or I wouldn't be doing all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, should because... flip, I, I, I could flip it around to you, Jessica. You're you're obviously yeah. a public public history um, uh, supporter in many ways over the last few years. But yeah, why do you think it's it's um, what does it say about public history writing in general for you? Well, I, I definitely I think it's worth it. I also think that. Um, you never know what the reach of your public history writing is going to be. And sometimes, you know, it's only read by 25 people and, you know, and sometimes it's read by thousands of people over the course of a decade. Right. And you never know quite what's going to hit with people. And you also don't know what's going to happen in the future. Like for instance, like, um, a couple of years ago, uh, someone wrote some piece about the Glengarry Cairn for our site, mm -hmm. and then the CBC ran a feature of this this uh, on on the Cairn this past summer, and all of a sudden, you know, everyone was googling it. So all of a sudden, a couple year old post was getting you know hundreds of reads a day because there was this renewed interest in the subject. And you kind of just you don't really know about that, and there's a lot. I think that's what's fun about seeing the back of the site is that, you know, we always are publicizing the things that come out every day, but there's continued readership for everything that we post, right? And I'm happy to announce that we've re we're, we've surpassed 1 million views on the niche site this year. Wow. And um, hmm. that's pretty incredible, I think. And um, yeah, I just, it's kind of like, I think it's always, um, worth it and um you just it i think it just highlights that you just never know what's going to like hit a note and continue to be popular with people um i was just yeah. gonna look for the party hat and streamer emoji but I'd probably <laughs> break instagram and, and leave the call by mistake so <laughs> hooray instagram good good or hooray niche <laughs> good work yeah pretty cool yeah, but you're right. You're right. You just can't know what's going to what's going to catch and when. You know, and mm -hmm. if you send it to the if you send it to the media locally, I mean, usually we're disappointed as historians, right? We're like, ah, oh, they didn't. I spent all that time writing this piece and, yeah. and didn't get picked up. But then, three years or nine years later, it might. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Anyways, I think it's all very fascinating. I, I love the stats of it all, but uh, yeah. that's me. Um, yeah, but thank you for joining me again today, Josh. It's always wonderful to talk to you. My pleasure. And thanks for uh, all the work you do. And uh, it's just hopefully it's, I'm sure it is still inspiring uh, uh, new junior scholars to keep keep doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you again sometime. Thank you for joining me today. All right. Take Looking care. Looking forward to it. Bye. Bye.